Hello, everybody, and welcome and join us in here today for the One Million Lives webinar. My name is Josh Huggins. I'm a director of Principal People and a founding director of Safety for Good, the charity set up to raise the positive profile of the health and safety profession to encourage new and ambitious entrants into the industry and to celebrate the exceptional work that health and safety leaders do each and every day. I'm honored to be able to host this webinar on One Million Lives, the free innovative tool to improve mental health globally. Hopefully by the end of this webinar, we will have given you a clear overview of the benefits of One Million Lives, what the tool is and how we believe it will allow us to affect change globally. We will have presented to you the facts and findings of One Million Lives so far and the statistics that we've seen along with some interpretation. We will, of course, encourage you to use the tool yourself and to share this with your organizations, your friends and your family. And overall, hopefully we can eliminate the stigma attached to mental health and affect over one million lives globally. Alongside me, I have a star studded panel today, hopefully are, who are able to explain a lot more about this tool than I am. So I'd like to introduce to you Paul Hendry, the Global Vice President of HSE at Jacobs and a co-founder of One Million Lives. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Peter Slocum, the Director at Agile Consulting Psychology, another co-founder of One Million Lives, who is a registered psychologist and who created the science behind One Million Lives. Thank you for having me and good evening from Australia. Thank you, Peter. And Donald Morrison, the Senior VP and General Manager for People and Places Solutions Europe at Jacobs, an operational leader who I think can give a different perspective on the value of One Million Lives and also some success stories to share. Thanks, Josh. Good to be with you today. Brilliant. So um, just as a reminder to everybody, we have 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to, uh, to ask questions of our panelists. Uh, and uh, we would really recommend adding the questions to the Q&A so that I can pose those to them. Uh, and uh, you can upvote the questions that you like. So if you like the look of some questions, please upvote them. Any questions that we don't get time to answer today, we will come back to in each and every one of them personally when we send uh, circular emails afterwards. So to begin our discussions and to check that you're all here with me and listening, uh, we have a quick four question uh, survey that we'd like to ask of you, which should be popping up onto your screen now. So it'd be great if we could have 20 to 30 seconds to just answer these questions. Uh, and we can reflect on some of these answers later. So perhaps five more seconds. So thank you. If I could have the results on screen, and just bearing in mind with regards to the audience that we have here is, is quite a uh, particular focus within health and safety and an HR. I think it's quite clear to see, especially with the first two questions, the overwhelming response of people who know of or have suffered from men poor mental health, but actually only 45% of individual, sorry, 55% of individuals have actually physically checked their mental health in the last 12 months. And Paul, perhaps if I could bring you in on this, I suppose this is perhaps one of the reasons why One Million Lives came to exist is that although it's something that affects so many of us, actually not the whole of the population are doing something about it. So uh, perhaps over to you to explain a bit more about the origins, if that's okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, the origins, but, but, but to your point, you know, a lot of people don't know they actually are impacted by mental health and, until it's too late. Um, so when I talk about the origins of One Million Lives, um, and you mentioned a co-creator, and, and, and Peter came in to, to Jacobs to run a, a trial um, as part of a, another campaign that, that she was running. And um, I really liked what that campaign was telling us, and it, it was trialled in our APAC business, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. And I really liked, you know, what that campaign was telling us. I really liked the kind of comment from our staff who had taken part in a, you know, the first kind of um, version of a mental health check-in. And 
and it kept kind of coming back to me and coming back to me. And we've done a lot in Jacobs around uh, mental health. From 2015, we've been running our Mental Health Matters programme, and it's something that we are like extremely proud of. Honestly, this has done amazing things for the culture and our organisation. We have our CEO, he is a positive mental health champ, uh, all of our ELT, and, and, and Donald is one as well, right? And we've got 2,400 mental health champs across Jacobs, and it's probably the equivalent more like your mental health first aider, right? But for me, that was the kind of the crux of it. If you like, I always felt there was something more proactive that we could do and prevent perhaps that, that first aid. So the, the stuff that Peter did with her business just kept coming back to me, kept coming back to me. So, you know, I connected with Peter and, and funnily, she had the, the same kind of thoughts and ambitions that I have about kind of leading change in a global scale with, with this, you know, using Peter's expertise and using kind of my reach within Jacobs and our supply chain, we started thinking a lot bigger and a lot bigger. And we really had that ambition of, you know, touching one million lives, right? And and leading change in a global scale. And, and you mentioned about being a, a co-creator, um, Peter and I, but there's, a, there's another small team that came in behind us um, that actually made it, made it happen. Like Katie, Amanda, Tom, Chris, Louise, Simita, Grant, Estelle and Vanessa, right? these people with a small team who kind of really drove this. And then and then once we did this, we had the whole of Jacobs behind us. So people like Donald and Donald's team and all the different regions really got behind us. And, and the kind of philosophy for me is, is about being that ripple. And a lot of organizations on this call, as an example, will be doing some amazing stuff from a mental health perspective. Our view was through one million lives is if we can always all just push this and, and kind of join hands we can actually tackle this together think how much stronger we would be if we all tackled the same topic together and that was the kind of ambition behind this and that's why we decided to make it um open source um josh that so that our friends and families our supply chains our communities everybody could actually get behind it and actually, you know, we don't know the we don't know the the kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for. We don't know the total of this whole mental health. Um, people call it a pandemic until we start measuring people's mental health, and I think that's a key thing around one million lives. We're actually measuring something, and that because we measure it, we can actually do something about it. So for us, it was about putting mental health in our own hands, in my hands, and in, in your hands, and. In, in doing the check-in and um, yeah, totally blown away by the, the amount of interest we have in it. But, you know, it took us a few years to, to get off the ground, but I actually think once COVID came, I actually think, you know, the stars were aligned a little bit because we, we, we launched it mid-COVID and it's really helpful um, in this period. And you mentioned about making it open source. So originally, when you uh, developed this, was it uh, a, just a Jacobs tool that you were looking for and you realised the scale which made you want to open it up? Yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it was. True story. Um, yeah, so originally it was for, for Jacobs and I was sitting with um, one of my daughters. You know, that, that way you're like, what are you working on? Dad type of thing. And, and Anna's now 22. And I was sitting with one of my daughters going through some of the questions. How would you answer this? Et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out, you know, through using this at the trial period that um, we identified that my daughter suffers from kind of um, social anxiety, right? Through this, through this check-in, and I thought to myself that actually she can't even access this because she doesn't work for Jacobs. Yes. So what's the point in me looking after my mental health when my loved ones, you know, haven't got the resources? So that's that's how it became. That's how it became. You know, we decided let's try and make it open source. Let's get it out there. And then that's where the whole One Million Lies kind of brand came in. Brilliant. And you, um, you, you mentioned about the fact that it was, it was built for Jacobs. But for, I suppose from a wider perspective, when you started to see that impact from your side, you recognised that there was a bigger picture to play. But what about Jacobs? Because I'm sure that there was a lot of time investment that went into this. Um, how easy or hard was it to convince 
the executives to to make it an open source platform that others could learn and share from? Um, it was easy to a degree to because they've all got friends and family as well, right? And they're all massive advocates of of my, uh, mental health, right? And, and try to improve mental health. You know, when your CEO stands up and says four of his six kids suffer from mental health, it's like you're, you're kicking at an open door, if you like. And so getting the funding was was the easy part. They were totally behind it from day one. The harder part was satisfying risk, cyber security, legal. Yeah. That was the hard part. And these guys have all obviously got a tough job to kind of protect the organization. So that was a tough part. The easy part was getting the organization behind that. And I mean, from our privileged role of speaking to a number of health and safety leaders, I know how high on the agenda this is for, for most of them. But I also hear the pain and frustration of dealing with those uh, individuals within their organizations that perhaps don't want to open up I think I've heard it referred to as Pandora's box and um, get into these things. How would you, or what tips would you give to health and safety leaders or HR leaders who are trying to affect that change to enable their organization to see the benefits? Yeah, look, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question, right? And you need to totally believe it yourself. You need to have the passion for it. All of those challenges, you know, I faced, within Jacobs, even when we, when, when we launched our first Mental Health Matters, um, I had to satisfy legal, you know, and, and I had to actually push back. I remember, um, and, and remember this is global as well. So I remember sitting with um, lawyers in Pasadena um, who were really kind of risk averse and, and pushing back and pushing back and pushing back. And eventually I got there and this will probably be, when, when I think about my career and I, I talk to, I mentor some people and, and, and I think of my career, I think of, this is a great example of how to um, just keep pushing through, keep pushing through, be committed, know that you're doing the right thing, you know, dust yourself down every time you get a knockback and, and, and make it happen. And, and you will make it happen and it becomes much more satisfying. Completely agree. And thank you for sharing that experience. Peter, if I could come on to you perhaps to talk a bit around some of the more technical side, the science behind it, um, perhaps some of the validation and, and work that you've done. Could you just explain a bit around what sits behind the tool and uh, how does it work? Sure. Thanks, Josh. And um, Paul made some, some really good points there. And um, one comment I would make when we talk about mental health in organisations is that prior to these sorts of tools, when you ask people, and I think people listening, if you ask them, how do you know where mental health is at in your organisation? Um, I was executive manager of empl uh, an employee assistance program for a long time. And you know, it was almost comical. People would say, look, we don't have a problem with mental health in our organisation because nobody uses the service, so therefore there's no need. And then you go to another company and they'd say, look, we're really happy that so many people are using it because it, you know, it just shows that, you know, that they're getting fixed. And um, so, look, I think this is the ability to kind of put some, some, some really key metrics um, around it. Looking at, I guess, the science behind it, and this is the third time that I've built a, a, an element of a tool, sometimes internally for a clinical facility and other times for um, uh, other, um, other elements of it. But obviously Jacobs is incredibly um, unique and Paul's vision for this and, and getting Jacobs behind that was uh, certainly a, a massive um, credit to him. One of the things that um, I noticed a lot is that quite a few people are what we call high functioning. Um, in terms of they have um, significant challenges with their mental health, but they pull themselves up with their bootstraps by other, you know, they, they cope and they have caffeine for the energy because they're tired all the time. And, um, and then, you know, they have, um, they have, you know, they listen to meditations and music and they try to do things. So the reality is it's still hard underneath that they have to work really hard for that. So one of the things for me was how can we start to measure mental health before it becomes problematic? So to cut to the chase around the science behind the, um, the scales used in One Million Lives, um, every single one of them are clinically validated, globally recognised scales. Um, there are obviously uh, some cultural and 
age related limitations around that that I won't get into but suffice to say that uh, the fact that it's, it's done in English and you know we, we have certain recommendations around ages um, actually um, measures that. The primary rigour around the assessment is what's called the K10, which is the Kessler 10, which is the most used um, sort of psychological assessment globally. Um, in Australia, um, mostly in the US, in most countries, if you go to see your doctor, they'll give you those 10 questions in the waiting room. And the reason for that is that it's looking not to diagnose people, which needs a full kind of interview and history and um, by a, um, a health practitioner, but it does give the most um, empirically recognised um, way of saying how, how much um, uh, are people in psychological um, distress. One of the things then um, we do is we look at the K10 and the, again there's no accident in the fact that that is um, uh, 10 questions not diagnosing people but looking at uh, the likelihood, the K10 measures the likelihood that people have a mental health disorder. All of the other um, levels of the test, so of the um, uh, the assessment, the One Million Lives tool, um, they can pretty much be split into three different areas. One is how much psychological distress are people currently in. Two is what are the things that we know from the research are most likely to accompany the onset of um, uh, poor mental health. So, for example, if you have low resilience, you're not bouncing back from challenges, you're not sleeping, you're waking early in the morning, you're tired all the time um, for no good reason, um, then we measure that. And then we also measure some things. If people are well and they're functioning really well, we aim to kind of do some future proofing, if, if you can dare use the term around mental health, to say, um, say, for example, if you are mentally he healthy and well and you come up very well on the K10 and you are sleeping well and you're resilient, but you happen to be incredibly perfectionistic and you have no social supports and those sorts of things, then we would say, awesome, great score, and why don't we work on these things before they get um, pressure tested? So again, the, the measures go into the kind of the current, the early signs, and then the, um, the preventative. Thank you. And uh, I know when we've been speaking about this off, offline, um, you've mentioned around the fact that actually not all the questions are weighted similarly. There's, there's different questions that yes. uh, deliver different results. Could you just explain that for the audience so they can understand? Yeah, look, there's a lot of thought that went into this, a lot of clinical rigour, um, a lot of um, psychiatric input, psychological input. And so to, I guess, to to look at it um, in general, when people do the check-in, they'll get a percentage score. If they do the full check-in, 80% um, of your overall score is weighted on the K10. Okay, so um, if you show signs of psychological distress, if you're answering things like, um, I feel um, anxious and fidgety most of the time to the point that I can't kind of self-soothe, um, that there's feelings of um, hopelessness and or worthlessness, um, unable to cheer up um, most of the time over a 30-day period, those sorts of things. If you get a low K10 score, your overall score will be low because 80% of the score is based on that. If you have a high K10 score, um, but you have really poor sleep, you're not bouncing back from challenges, um, and you are significantly withdrawing and avoiding life stresses, then there's a high correlation with those measures um, and mental health as well. So those, those scales will lower your score um, a little. And then you've got some scales that are just based on insight. As I said, our aim is not to run around sort of tap people on the shoulder with a, a diagnosis our aim is to say to people what we would like to do is put a floodlight on in the room and show you all the different corners of that so things like coping scales when it gives people two baskets if you like these are the engaging these are the helpful ways to solve problems and these are the um, disengaging ways it sort of then gives insight into those because most people actually don't know what their scores are like in terms of normal 
populations. You know, somebody might have always been perfectionistic um, and they just say, well, that's just, you know, that's how everybody is. Everybody wants to do that well. Um, but when you look at sort of overall populations, you'd say that's that's actually um, not the case. So the overall score is 80% loaded on the K10 because if you're in a GP's office, that would be that. But um, as I said, it could go up or down based on um, three other scales. And one of the things that really stood out to me, and I know internally at, at Principal People, we've been uh, encouraging our team to use the tool, is the fact that it's much more of a proactive measure than a reactive measure when uh, you know, once somebody's got to the point that they re need real intervention. Um, and Donald, if we could come on to you as an operational leader, how has the implementation of One Million Lives uh, kind of helped your business uh, and uh, I know that you've got a few success stories you'd like to share about uh, the work that's been done with it. Yeah great thanks Josh happy to kind of comment on that and you know maybe even build on a couple of the links from what Paul and Peter have already said you know as an organisation our health and safety foundations go back many years but there was a real inflection point around 2004 when there was the tragic events in the, the, the BP Texas oil refinery, when we lost a number of staff. And that was really the, the genesis for our uh, Beyond Zero journey, um, you know, as that uh, campaign's been called. So we're, you know, 17 years into that. And uh, really from the start, that engendered a new level of belief in the organization. Um, you know, I think if you looked at, a, you know, even at a sector level, the changes I've seen in my career have just been really marked in our approach to health and safety. And the analogy that was given to me at an early stage, Josh, just in terms of onboarding with Beyond Zero was around the 100 metre sprinter. Not that I am one myself, mm -hmm. but the 100 metre sprinter running to way beyond the tape. And that analogy worked until uh, I think it was the Beijing Olympics and Usain Bolt came along and he was so good he could slow down at 85 metres. But, you know, what, what we've seen now, uh, you know, is, is one million lives and our whole approach to mental health over the last three or four years is what's really taking the, the organisation um, to, to a different level now. And I think if we look at just the complexity of business, uh, you know, and perhaps typified, you know, over the last year with the, the impacts of the pandemic and, you know, the, the agility of business. Um, there's so many different levers that we need to pull to keep um, business operating effectively. And you know, I, I, as a business, Jacobs don't actually have any product that we sell. Um, you, we, all, all we sell is talented people. And we, so we really want our people to be the best they can be, you know, in every regard. And, you know, I think, as I said earlier, that evolution of, of engineering and construction over the last probably three decades, where there's been a much more overt focus on health and safety, we, we believe this will take us to the next level. And I think, as you know, as we've discussed previously, um, one of our core values that we've changed slightly recently um, it used to be worded as that, that people are our greatest asset. And I always used to change that right in my own mind. People are our own. Again, you know, really typified by the pandemic over the last 12 to 14 months. Um, you know, that that's something that's really at the front of our minds. And, you know, as an organization, we're also really known for creating legacies. You know, a lot of what we do is um, creating physical legacies from things like the London Olympic Park to the Panama Canal to, you know, many other projects and programs across the globe. You know, I think this tool could perhaps be the greatest legacy we ever create. Um, you know, Peter talked a lot there about measurement. You know, I, we will never be able to really measure the, the, the success or the impact of this tool fully, but I'm sure it will go way beyond, you know, our wildest expectations, you know, in a really positive way. And I think uh, us as an organisation being able to leave that kind of legacy, um, you know, for um, the world is a, is a great thing. And I remember when Paul first started sp speaking to me about it, 
I think it was back in sort of September, October 19. And as Paul said earlier, the timing with the pandemic and everything was just, you know, it, it couldn't have been better by the time we actually came to launch the tool. Um, you, you know, this was really focused on, you know, g g giving back and, you know, maybe turning it, you know, more to how I see, it, you know, I, I applying in, in our operations um, globally now. You know, I think there, you know, one of the things that I certainly believe as a leader in our business that really helps you create a high performing team is a level of vulnerability in individuals. And, you know, I think when I when I look at the tool, I, I probably go into it at least once a week. And hopefully we can get into some of this detail in the questions around just how simple it is to use. I did a check in um, earlier this morning and I've, I've got it here just in front of me. It said I've actually got high well-being today. But even when I've got high well-being, there's still four things that will take me to the next level in it that you know I need reminded about. I think we've all got so much coming at us in this world day in, day out, that it's great to just be able to pick up on you know what one one or two of these points. And you know, one of the tips there today for me with high well-being is make a conscious effort to, effort to smile more at people today and pay attention to the impact. And you know, I think something really simple at that that's just a reminder, we don't know you know, the impact that something like that will have. So again, as, as a leader in Jacobs, I think one of my favorite definitions of leadership is leadership's about getting people what you want them to do because they want to do it. So it's really that ability of any individual in an, org in an organization to inspire. And there's a great quote that often comes to my mind when I, when I talk about that. It's by, I think it's either attributed to the Chinese or Benjamin Franklin. I don't know quite how you got those, that juxtaposition, but it's tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember and involve me and I learn. And I think as we involve people in something so practical like this, like Paul talking to his daughter, that example, hey, Jacobs are much more than just a big project delivery organization. We really are about, you know, having an impact and creating, um, you know, legacy in um, society and way beyond. And, you know, maybe just rounding this off, Paul, before, uh, Josh, before we get into questions, you know, I think you asked Paul about the motivation for this. I think once I was asked by our CEO, who Paul referred to one of the first times I met him over dinner, he said, what's your biggest regret in your career? And that's a, a pretty easy one for me. It's when I don't act in my intuition or don't go with my gut instinct, because I think the longer you go on in your career, the more often than not that you're right. And it's having that confidence and humility to actually act. So, you know, I think this is something that, you know, Paul and, you know, a number of others in our organization, had, but particularly Paul had real commitment behind doing it. Yes, there was many obstacles and hurdles to overcome. Do I think it was the right thing? Absolutely. So I think, you know, really getting on now and get, getting the message out. And, you know, I'm, I'm always an optimist. And I think, you know, one million lives is actually quite a modest target. You know, and I think, you know, that's what excites me about doing these kind of sessions that we can spread the word more because it is deeply impactful. Absolutely. And it's a, you know, it's a very, I suppose it's a very bold statement for you to say about the legacy. This could be the greatest legacy of, yeah. uh, of, of, the, of the work that, that you guys are doing. Um, but I think that can't be underestimated how, how, big a, you know, how big an issue this is and, and how we are just scratching at the surface. I suppose from your view in operations rather than technically in health and safety, you're very much behind it, which is which is great. And I know that Paul's done a great job of, of selling that message to the to the organization. But what would you say to those individuals who struggle to get this past their operational leaders? And you know, with the different pressures that you are under, uh, how could you see something being positioned to get you on board if at this stage of, of time you weren't? Yeah, you know, I, I would perhaps go back to the Benjamin Franklin quote, Josh, about involve me and I learn. You know, I think some of the stories that um, I've heard of the, the suffering that our people have gone through over the last 13 or 14 months, um, you know, I think it, you know, it's absolutely our duty as an employer to, you know, really care for them and look out for them. And I think, you know, if, if you don't have engaged people in your organization, if you don't know what burdens and challenges they're bringing to the workplace, 
um, you know, I think there's a moral imperative for doing something about it. And this is just so practical. Y yes, there were challenges, as I said a minute ago, and I see some chat on that in the Q&A, you know, you know, about, you know, in particular geographies there being challenges. I, you know, again, I, I think get, get on with it, do it, live it day in, day out, talk about it. You know, we, we have a, a culture of caring moment at the start of all of our discussions, and that's something that we've kind of seeded in other parts of the industry with our clients, etc. And I think, you know, just sharing something like this, don't just do it once. If you believe it's the right thing to do, as I do, you know, you need to walk the talk. Um, so. Yeah. Absolutely. No, thank you very much for that. And um, so, uh, Peter and Paul, if I could come back to you with regards to some of the actual live data that we're seeing now, and I'm just going to share my screen with the uh, information that you that you shared with me earlier. Um, perhaps if you want to talk through this, Peter, and perhaps um, this initial these initial statistics, and then we can go on to the other parts of the uh, of the slides. Sure. Look, thank you. Um, and Paul, jump in at any point. Um, I was getting seduced by the awesome questions coming through there on the bottom mm. of the screen, so I shall uh, shall focus. Um, look, just uh, I guess a point, you know, for me as a as a treating clinician for the last twenty five years is that mental health is foreseeable and it's measurable and it's changeable, and yet most people, males and females, actually can't identify when they enter clinical ranges. So most organisational mental health strategies do look at. Um, you know, they have morning teas, they have posters, they have employee assistance programs, presentations, and they're all fantastic. But there really is a difference between knowing um, when, knowing what something is and knowing when you cross the line. And I think we'll talk about this when we talk about some of the um, results. Um, if you have a sore knee, you can go to the doctor and you can get an ultrasound or an MRI and you can see that you've got a torn ACL and you take the x-ray home you tell people that that's where it's at and so um, as many as much as people might know that that's a thing it's hard with mental health to actually know um, because our brains keep slowly and slowly adapting to the situation that we're in so there's often never a oh, wake up can't move my knee and I'm going to get get some help um, get some help with that so um, the measurement of that in terms of people understanding when you know um, they go from a tough sort of few weeks and months into clinical areas is something that most people don't predict when you say how's your mental health most people say oh good thank you and then when they do um, an assessment uh, it kind of turns out that uh, it's it's tough and and I think that's actually good news. I, I'm not one for getting caught up in looking for pathology. Um, but personally, I don't think that people should have to live lives as hard as they do quite often. You know, I often say just because you can run the New York Marathon with no shoes on doesn't mean you should actually do that. Um, and so that's kind of part of recognising when life could be a lot easier by looking at mental health. No one currently measures mental health in the world in terms of well populations, and that's what's exciting about this um, particular data, which we'll have a look at. Um, and even few of us know where to start. If you asked people, how do I improve my mental health? Most people would say something to you like, uh, I should uh, get off my screen at night. I should uh, exercise. Um, I should, um, you know, um, belong to a community. But it is a bit pin the tail on the donkey um, about where exactly are you at and what's the one thing that's going to create the most change for you. If we go to the next slide there, um, what we can start to see is if we look at who's checked in so far, this is what's um, geekily exciting um, for me as a clinician because um, people like the, the, um, the audience tonight, uh, the panellists, you will change more lives in mental health than someone like me um, will ever change because you have, you have credibility, you have access, and you can talk to people who, before they actually present into the health system. What we can see there, which is pretty typical of many workplace demographics, um, is that the age ranges um, in terms of accessibility is, is quite high. So we do have a really good mix of people checking in. Um, people under the age of 35 wouldn't normally go and get a mental health check. You know, they wouldn't pop into their, their doctor and, and, and see. Um, and so it's really good that we're, we're checking um, some of that now. 
The gender piece is super exciting for me because we know that mostly it's females that are more likely to step forward and put their hand up for help and support. Um, it is, it's historically been seen that females do suffer from mental health issues a lot more than males. But the more we have tools like this, the more we see that the gap is really narrowing between males and females. We can see here that in terms of um, those that have checked in um, so far, um, it's literally half and half um, with the other is split between um, prefer not to say and um, non-binary. Um, but we have males equally using these tools, which gives us a chance to then have people say, okay, I get it now, you've put some data behind it, I've got a score and I can start having a conversation with someone about that. Whereas if you have somebody who has to just present the talk therapy, it has to actually make an appointment and take that first sentence sitting in a doctor's or a psychologist's office and say, well, uh, I don't know, I, you know I'm here because um, it, we know that it's a lot more accessible once we, we give people a chance to privately um, measure where they're at. The third piece there is when we ask who, look at who's doing the check-in, 77% um, of people doing the check-in um, are doing it reasonably proactively. So they've never had a mental health, uh, they don't currently nor have they ever been diagnosed with a mental health issue. So it could well be that they've always felt like they've, they've sort of been dragging their feet a bit and things have been a bit um, heavier than they should be. Um, but for most people, they haven't necessarily presented into the health system. And so what we know is that often the first people in an organisation that will jump on board this tool are people who kind of have a suspicion that um, things are a little tougher than, than they should be. Um, and then um, we also have a lot of people just saying, look, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at it, which is fantastic because as a byproduct of a check-in, we're giving people um, preventative and proactive information, but we're also giving them a lot of education. So we're also changing workplace culture by giving people access to, hey, here's actually what, you know, if people didn't answer this way, um, here's, here's how it's feeling um, for them. So the fact that 77% um, are not in, um, presumably not in the system yet is, um, is awesome. The last slide there uh, that we have is, um, I think, now we've got two quick slides, but the next slide um, has a look at uh, the measures just briefly that we were talking about earlier. Um, so we can see that we're measuring things that might be visible, like psychological distress and sleep, um, difficulty bouncing back, right through to some things that people might not have um, as much um, visibility um, on. Um, and I just did the check-in as well, which may seem like it's not, you know, because I, I, I technically know, uh, know how, how we're scoring. Um, but I hadn't done it for a while and I was looking for some screenshots and I thought, oh, look, I'll just do another one. And um, I was really quite surprised at how um, it picked up. My psychological distress hadn't changed a great deal, but every other score was significantly lower. And it was it was a bit of a wake up call for me to kind of say, well, all right, let's let's um, let's let's do some work on that because um, the great thing is that it tracks your previous scores to give you um, give you some perspective. And the last piece there, we've got the last slide we have. So the data so far, so you can see down the bottom, we kind of go from light to dark in terms of the um, age demographics. What we can see is in terms of psychological distress, as a lot of the research is starting to tell us um, in general, um, psychological distress is higher the younger that you are. Um, and so um, you can see I've just added some labels there. So um, the lowest uh, category is normal, um, but everybody, all the age groups in the check-in are at least in the, um, in the mild range. Um, then we start to get into moderate and the 18 to 25, the average is not far off severe, which is um, pretty telling. Tougher in countries that have been in lockdown um, throughout, um, throughout the period that the check-in has been um, launched. Um, when we get to looking at resilience, um, you can see as well there's a direct kind of relationship between the higher your psychological distress resilience is down or 
for those, for example, in the 56-year-old categories, um, we can see that psychological distress um, is a little lower and resilience is higher. So that's interesting and it's, it's what we would um, expect. You can also see that the older we get, the less perfectionistic we get in terms of this, this data. So um, one of the challenges, and again, we can see for people who um, quite often have uh, social media, um, when we talk about addiction, it is an addiction scale. So it doesn't judge people for how much they use social media. It, it assesses um, how often they use it more than they planned how much conflict is caused as a result of it, and also things like, um, do they feel um, perhaps um, better or worse after they, they do that? So um, again, we can see perfectionism, low resilience, psychological distress are, are starting to, um, uh, to uh, relate. Um, same sort of uh, passion with um, social media addiction. Interestingly, so far we're finding social supports um, is, um, uh, not that different across the age groups. Um, and again, you can see the overall mental health um, in directly um, inverse proportions to psychological um, distress um, there. Summary, um, summary on the edge. Brilliant, thank you um, for that. And uh, really interesting. And of course, at the end of today, we'll share these, uh, we'll share this with the audience if, and if they want to follow up with you on anything particular around the, uh, the the sort of technical side of it, then I'm sure that they can reach out to you directly on that. Um, Absolutely. If we can move on to uh, some questions, then uh, it'd be great to uh, to talk uh, to talk through some of these. Um, so the first one that we have uh, from Sonia Mellish is, um, how have you achieved onboarding and challenged resistant attitudes from leaders in the business and changed negative cultural attitudes? Perhaps if I could ask Paul, you that one. Can you repeat the question? Of course. Josh. Yeah. How have you achieved onboarding and challenged resistant attitudes from leaders in the business and changed negative cultural attitudes? Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a great question, actually. Um, and there are cultural differences, you know, everywhere we go. You know, Donald has, Donald has mentioned within Jacobs, you know, we, we, we genuinely do have a great culture. We, we genuinely do from a safety perspective, but there are still pockets that you really need to work on. And for me, it's just articulating the why, making it personal and relevant. No, no matter what you do from a HSE perspective, the message needs to be personal and relevant to that person who you're hoping to land the message with. And it was the exact same with, with One Million Lives. You know, if I, if I go back to the whole journey around mental health and... And Jake, as I go back to like the previous leadership, there's just no way, you know, globally that you could have that conversation. That's why we started it off in the UK at first, because culturally um, they weren't ready to have that conversation. And, and almost when we're launching it in the UK and then and then we brought on Australia, then you start to get that kind of momentum building, this kind of groundswell where you just can't stop it after that. So there are cultural diff differences for sure. But I think it's about just getting that groundswell, to be honest, Josh, and getting more people behind it. And right, crucially, I always think if the boss, if the boss is behind it, everybody gets behind it, whether they want to or not. Yeah, for sure. And and Donald, you mentioned uh, earlier about the fact that you, you use the tool fairly frequently. A question from from Zach Wilson is: um, As mental health and well-being is an ever-changing balance, how many times can you use the tool, and how often would you recommend using it? Yeah, um, probably, you know, I think if I wanted to, I could use it every day. It is so quick to do the quick check-in literally takes 30 seconds. You know, once you've got the app downloaded, it's a really straightforward process. And literally, I, you know, I don't have a routine of doing it, but, you know, if I'm feeling the pressure of things, I'll maybe just go on and just uh, take those 30 seconds out and literally the result is there instantaneously. And I, I think, as I said earlier, Josh, it's just such a good reminder of just some really simple, simple, practical things. This isn't things that you need to go away and get any equipment or speak to somebody else about. It's, but it's about really simple behaviours and tips that you can then just apply um, to your situation. So um, maybe I should turn to Paul or Peta if, there, if there's a, a, an optimum frequency. But from my perspective, it's, it's pretty ad hoc, just as, as, as and when I think I need to use it. 
Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my perspective, then I'll, I'll pass to Peter, right? I'll be honest with you, you know, I don't get a great deal um, from the quick check-in, but I hear Donald talking about, about it all the time. I get I get much more benefit from doing the, the, the kind of full check-in, which takes about, about 12 minutes, but I don't do it. I don't do it like as regular as Donald. You know, there was, there was one time I was kind of, struggling and, and you know Peter mentioned perfectionism and, and I'm not a perfectionist in fact you know I turned up for this call and said do I have to do slides right so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's an example of that right but but the point the point being is you know there are times when I need to be a perfectionist and um, like when I produce an end of your reports quarter reports reports that go to the top of the the top of the business and there was a time mid lockdown <sighs> total withdrawn and isolated from my family um, work was really tough really tough working mega hours not exercising and and so I, I did the check-in and and honestly you know for everybody in the call you, you hear us talking about one million likes but please go and do the check-in because the full check-in because when you actually start to think about the questions and how they're worded you really start to kind of look inside yourself and answer them honestly. So when I did that, I understood then that my perfectionism was actually kind of paralyzing me, to be honest, and I'm not a perfectionist. It would stop me doing things, it would stop me make decisions. Really, really helpful for me. So for me, you know, I'll probably do a full check-in every couple of months. Great, and Peter, is there, I mean, from a clinical perspective, do you have a, uh, a position on this? Yeah, look, a uh, full check-in um, a monthly is ideal. You can probably get away with fortnightly, but we certainly wouldn't want to do any more than, um, than that. Um, and the quick check-in um, certainly can pretty much be done every day, every second day. Um, I think one of the power is the powerful pieces of whenever you do it is just being able to kind of track that. So you think it's not changing, but then you can kind of look over time and it, um, and it, and it clearly has. If I can just answer a quick, and I noticed there were some other kind of cultural questions around it, particularly around resistance. My philosophy, and I think what Jacobs have done really well is that, um, if you think your mental health is good and you think you don't need to do it, that is absolutely awesome. But every time you do do it and you do talk about the fact that you've done it, you just made it easier for five or 10 people around you to do it. So actually I would say it's not even about us. It's about the fact that somebody in our team or in our family or at our dinner table might be struggling and they'll be embarrassed to kind of say, look, I'm going to go to some sort of, service and, and get a test but to kind of have everyone say I'm doing it it will help that person and I think there's very few people that don't want to help the people around them in that way. Uh, yeah abs absolutely I think that that's a really important message and something that we've been speaking about from the first discussion Paul you and I had about it about reducing the stigma of talking around mental health and a tool like this can provide that platform to allow people to, for it to be on the agenda I suppose. Um, jo Josh you know what you know it's kind of really quite ironic you know I talk about eliminating the stigma and you know talk about mental health like probably every ever right um, and I'm not a talker right um, I try and work things out for myself, but so far I've been successful in doing that through the challenges I, I have in my life. But having this mental health tool would now give me something to bounce my thoughts and fears off of, you know, if I don't want to, to talk about it. And, and if there's people on this call who know me, they will understand that I can go, I can go deep sometimes and, and I won't talk about it. I need to work it out for myself. And this, this thing, this tool helps you do that. A really um, interesting question that's that's come up and something that I've not uh, asked you before personally, uh, well, Paul or, or Peter or, or Donald, if you've experienced this, but what happens if the tool identifies someone that is in a crisis? So, you know, it's, it's not a not proactive measure anymore. It needs to be something that's a bit more reactive. Is there a built in flag that can alert support? Yeah. Um, what happens there? So, so look, clinically, um, you know, it was certainly um, uh, something that was very strongly on my radar all the way through this about what happens if somebody sits there somewhere and starts to answer questions. And again, fortunately, it's been a lot of years now for me of noticing the good come out of it. Um, so look, to answer that briefly, at any point in time, there's a do you need help now button at the top. 
Um, and so people can click that and straight away there's links to all the emergency resources. In addition to that, it is made clear that in itself, it's not an emergency, you know, resorts. It's not, it's not a kind of crisis service. So we aim to not sort of distress people and kind of abort the mission, mission and tell them to get off the. We just kind of go, look, if you're doing this and you feel that way, just click, click the top of the the button. I think there's a uh, the, the need help now um, button, and um, and it will just kind of suggest a whole lot of resources, including places that you can call by phone and online. Thank you. Um and uh, Donald, I suppose perhaps a question for you. With uh, with the young, uh, from the results that we saw from Peter, with the young, with younger people having the lowest resilience, the highest sense of perfectionism, and the highest social media addiction, how can we support young professionals better with their mental health? Yeah, well, what one of the things that we're trying to do now is actually get our offices reopened as quickly as possible in a sustainable way. Um, because I think the young are particularly hankering after that and have been the worst affected through the pandemic. Um, you know, generally, if you look at where our offices are located across the globe, a lot of them will be in the big urban centres deliberately, but which is where obviously property prices are the highest. And you know, the, generally, a lot of our staff will be in you know, accommodation with two or three of them, and they're the ones who've been working on their sofas or their kitchen tables for the last... 13 or 14 months. So I think that that's fundamental. So we're really pushing that at the moment. I think we've also got a really active, um, what we call our GEN network, our Jacobs Employee Networks, and they um, really transcend a number of cultural, <coughs> excuse me, barriers and groupings. And we look to get, get them together. And very much in the design of our offices now, we're looking at um, really focuses of where the offices are more and more going to become places just where, where our people gather for collaboration and meet. And, uh, you know, we've successfully trialled that in some of our biggest global offices recently, and we see that as a really key feature in this. And I think, as I said earlier, Josh, I think this is just part of the, the complexity of our modern day lives. There's really good sides to social media. There's really bad sides to social media. How do we help everybody get these things in balance? And I think, you know, as an organization that's a, a service provider predominantly at the moment, you know, how do we really, you know, I, I talk a lot about different methods of communication and there's only point in doing communication if you can actually get engagement. So I think looking at the different facets of the different communication approaches that we've got, and I know, you know, a lot of organizations have struggled with this over the last 13 or 14 months. And, uh, you know, we probably don't do anything particularly unique in Jacobs. We do do town halls within the whole the whole company globally, um, led by our CEO. I lead them in our region. But I think one of the most impactful things is actually, again, you know, that showing of vulnerability that I referred to earlier. Um, I, I do small group sessions of 10 to 15 people, um, and they I, I don't invite anybody. I just get a list. I, I think people apply to come and speak to me. I just want to hear what's on their minds and be able to perhaps correct perceptions. So I, I, I think it is part of this elaborate weave of, you know, just real dri driving engagement through multiple uh, touch points. Thank you. Um, the questions are still coming in, but I've, I'm conscious of time and the fact of Josh, getting through just, everything. Josh, just, just let me come in there just for a, just for a second. Um, based on a lot of the, a lot of our findings um, around our initial tranche of data, we are launching or releasing a, a thought leadership paper, right? And, and that gives you some insight into some of that data. And so as an example, in our organization, I've asked the organization to prioritize under 35s with access to the office because okay. of the data we are getting from One Million Life. So that's all in this paper, which is going to be released hopefully, you know, this week, next week. And where will that be released? Is that just internally or, or is that... No, it's 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 ex external release, so it'll be through all the social media channels, Jacobs Connects, etc. Okay, brilliant. And if if any of the audience want to uh, see that, are they okay to get in contact with you or with us to signpost them in the right place? Yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, um, as I said, in terms of the questions, thank you so much to the audience for uh, for sending them in. We will make sure we respond to every single one and, and come back to you, and we can share that via email to you all. So. Uh, so please do uh, get in touch with us if you have any further questions. I'd just like to finish with a couple of things uh, with regards to safety for good, because I think 
most of you that are on this call will know about Safety for Good, but uh, wanted to just recap slightly. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, Safety for Good uh, is a charity that was formed by uh, some members of principal people, uh, IOSH, uh, a couple of other industry bodies and executive leaders of health and safety to raise the positive profile of the profession, to shine a light on the exceptional work that health and safety individuals do and to make health and safety a career of choice for future generations. And One Million Lives certainly comes into that category, which is why we're absolutely behind it and support it. A couple of other things that we're doing as part of Safety for Good, we have a Future Leaders Mentoring Programme, of which Paul is an executive coach within. Here we're looking at developing careers of individuals around their softer skills and focusing on leadership qualities to help and enable people from all backgrounds to develop in their health and safety uh, careers. So if you are interested, we'll share this slide with you, click on the link and you can register your interest. In terms of our upcoming events that we're hosting, uh, we have a, an event coming up on Wednesday, the 9th of June, which is Inside Safety one year on. Last year, in the midst of the pandemic, we surveyed a number of leaders in health and safety to get their views on what was happening during the pandemic, how their organisation was adapting and what they thought the future would look like for the health and safety profession. We're reviewing that and, uh, and more. Um, so as part of that panel discussion, we have a number of leaders, including Andrew Kavanagh from the co-op, Louise Ward from Siemens, Richard Byrne from Travis Perkins and Amanda Rowan from Heathrow Airport. On Wednesday the 6th of October, we're hosting a sports and risk management event. Hopefully this will be in person, uh, fingers crossed with regards to the pandemic and things opening up. Um, we're exploring the links between top level sport and overall risk management and seeing what we can learn from this. Um, we have confirmed Mark Gallagher, who was a former principal of a F1 racing team and is a keynote speaker. We're in very last minute talks with a England Rugby World Cup winner who may be able to share his experience around some uh, of the head traumas that are faced by rugby professionals and what the sport are doing to make it safer. And at the end of the year, we're looking at hosting a Future Leaders Programme Awards, which will be an invite event for people who have participated in the programme. So if you're interested in any of those, please get in contact with, with us and uh, we'll be delighted to speak to you about that. I think I'd like to just finish off by saying thank you to our, our uh, panellists. Uh, you've been great to share some of the insights of One Million Lives. Thank you for developing this tool because I think it can have a, a huge amount of impact. But I think a call to action for all of our attendees on, on this. We are looking to affect over 1 million lives. Donald mentioned it's a, 1 million lives is an ambitious number, but also when you take into consideration the world population, uh, a number that we should be able to achieve. And if everybody on this webinar was able to share it with some friends and family, their colleagues, and also their organizations, we could fairly quickly impact positively 1 million lives globally. So we'd really like you to get behind this, share the message, post on your social media, on LinkedIn about this event, please check into the tool yourself. I think it goes in line with World uh, Safety and Health at Work Day, which is tomorrow. Uh, everything that we're trying to do here is the positive uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the human race. So let's focus on this. One Million Lives, I think, is a fantastic tool, and we're delighted to be a partner of it. So thank you, Paul, Peter, and Donald, for your time. And uh, we look forward to joining you all on the next webinar that we host. Thank you. Hey, Thanks thank you so much. much. Thanks, thank everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks very much.